All right, thank you, Chachi. Thank you all for being here. Um, also, thank you for, to the organizers for inviting me. Now, my, name is, my name is Andreas. Um, I'm here to talk to you about building high performance tools in Python. Um, and so, high performance has this property where it makes what seems like a really simple thing all of a sudden horrifically complicated. And um, part of the, uh, what relates to the other part of my title is um, in the process of making these horrifically, horrifically complicated things, some people forget that they're sitting in front of a computer that can help them with this horrifically complicated task. And um, my, ba my main message is you shouldn't do that. Have the computer help. And that's what this Bicycles for the Mind is about. Namely, a computer is like a bicycle for the mind. It lets your brain go further with less effort, right? Um, so I would also like to thank the people who've made this possible over the years. I've worked on a lot of this stuff with Tim Warburton at Rice, um, Jan Hesthaven, who was my doctoral advisor at Brown, Leslie Greengard, um, whom, whom I worked with as a postdoc at NYU, also the people who've uh, contributed to the packages um, that I maintain, and um, I've, I've received hardware. Uh, from a bunch of companies, so if, you, if, if I sound biased, that may be why. Um, right, anyway, um, so what's going on with high performance computing right now is in some sense really good because after a long time where the, the system, the, the, the computer system that we were targeting was essentially static, right? There was not much happening, a processor was a processor. So, all of a sudden, there's all this, this big old mess of, of hardware going on, right? There's tons of chips, even, you know, these wildly different chips came out in, in 2012, and um, there's competition in terms of what model is the right one. So that's really interesting and good news. Except, it's up to us to program all that stuff, right? And, you know, that, that means somebody has, somebody has to figure out how to do that. Um, well, okay, and where is this all headed? Somehow it's, it's headed towards this nightmare where there's infinitely many cores, there's infinitely many ve vector lanes inside of each core, and then t getting data from memory takes infinitely long, in term, you know, measured in terms of clock cycles. And that's, wow, I can't even wrap my head around that. So program programmability is really the main issue here, right? We need help programming this stuff, and how is this going to happen? Well, this is still PyCon, right? So, <laughs> but, okay. Um, it's not exactly like scripting languages have this reputation for being <laughs> fast. I don't know. So, I must be joking, right? It, like, the, some, something here really doesn't make sense. Why am I talking? about high performance and Python in the same sentence. Well, it turns out, if you look at a, at a proper high performance code, there's actually a lot more to it than just computing the result at the very end. It's actually, a, you know, um, some bit that organizes the computation as well. This has to happen, that has to happen, libraries need to get imported, everybody needs to talk. And be, even before that, somebody has to write the code. Some people do that by hand, I think that's a mistake. Um, and somebody then but ha would have to describe at least what, what they would like to happen. And my idea is, well, um, let's leave what computes the result to something that's actually good at that. Namely, um, in this case, we'll, we'll leave it to something called OpenCL. I'll say a word about that. Um, and we'll leave all, the, all these organizational tasks to Python, which that's what Python is good at, organizing, gluing stuff together. Right. Um, so what is this OpenCL thing? Um, by its own admission, as in from its um, spec, OpenCL, the Open Computing Language, is an, a, an open, royalty-free standard for general purpose parallel programming across CPUs, GPUs, and other processors. So um, another way of describing OpenCL is it's essentially like NVIDIA CUDA, just with all the green stickers peeled off. Um, and that means it's, it's vendor neutral. It's not targeted to exactly just NVIDIA. It can do all of the same things though. Um, but to me, what makes it even better than that is that it's also neutral in terms of what device it targets. So with CUDA, you're, you, know, tar you know you're talking to a GPU, but really the programming model makes a lot of sense not just for GPUs, but also for CPUs and you know, whatever other crazy processor comes along. 
Um, and the other thing that's really nice from a Python point of view is that a just-in-time compiler is built right into the, sta uh, into the, into the um, standard. So you can rely on the fact that you can compile a bunch of C code and run it on the device. Just, that's, that's built into the thing, and you don't have to worry about it. Um, right. So, but let's back up one step, just so that you understand what this where this whole nightmare comes from. Right? Why are we worried about this? Why, why are computers all of a sudden changing out from under us? And you know, you're, you're sitting all comfortably in front of your laptops and they're getting sort of maybe slightly faster every year. I don't know. Um, have you noticed them getting much faster? Who has? Who hasn't? <laughs> I certainly have. I'll, I'll tell you a little story in, in just a second. Um, so the nightmare really started um, a couple of years back. And if, you, if I look at this here, what this is is um, sort of um, an, a magnification of what a processor, and this is a fairly old one, but the, the nightmare is really much the same today. Um, is th this is what um, a processor looks like up close. And I find this picture just really, really depressing. Why, so why is this depressing? Because if you look at this, the bit that does work, right? I'm, so I'm a numerical guy, I care about number crunching, and so that means I want floating point work done. Um, see that thing down here that says FP? That's the floating point unit. So can you, how much of this chip area is dedicated to floating point work? <laughs> that, that's what's depressing. So what's, what's all this other junk doing? Well, um, it turns out the business of all, of all this other, other stuff is to just make sure the floating point unit has enough data to work with. Why is that? Well, um, actually it turns out there's a very good physical reason for that. Um, the reason is, um, well, we move data through wires, right? There's a wire that goes between the processor and the memory, so that means in order to get the data from A to B, um, you have to charge a little capacitor. How do you do that? Well, you push in electrons at one end, and if you want that to happen fast, well, um, then you have to meet a trade-off between how much power you put in the, un the, the one end and how long you wait, right? And since, since processors are limited in how much power they can devote to this task, that means getting data to and from memory takes a long time. So if you write this program then, right, and you say, well, computer, okay, go do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, and then once you're done with that, do this. And every step of the way, the computer has to go like, okay, um, I'm computing, and then I need to get something from memory. Oops. <laughs> right, and then you do, well, really nothing. <laughs> and, oh, look, it came back from memory. That's awesome. So we can compute again. Um, obviously, that's, that's not a happy scenario, right? Um, because that bit right there, you're not really doing useful work. So how do you avoid that? Well, it turns out it's the job of all this other stuff on the processor to try and prevent exactly this from happening by ex executing stuff out of order and caching and stuff, right? Um, but it turns out not many programs need to be that sequential, right? If you instead serve up to the processor a big bunch of stuff that it can do in really any order that it prefers, um, this picture becomes a lot less depressing. You can have, well, okay, here's one thing that computes away and then it needs to get something from memory, that's fine, we've just switched to something else. And then that hits a stall and we switch to the next thing and um, by the time we've done that a bunch of times, we can go back to the first one, right? So we can handle latency that way much more elegantly and also much more power efficiently. Problem is, though, we need to change exactly how we program because this, the way that we program right now is very sequential and instead what we need to allow is concurrency, right? That's, that's a little separate from parallel program. It, we're here, this is still just one processor, but we just have less of a promise what's happening in what order, right? We're just allowing the processor to do stuff in any order, but once we allow concurrency, we can also go ahead and say, well, then we can just execute a bunch of stuff in parallel as well, right? Because parallel programming relies on that same 
promise of, well, it, I don't care what order you do this in. So once we're at that stage, we'll add two levels of parallelism. We'll add um, the conventional multi-core type parallelism, where you just you know, take the same core and you stamp it onto the chip a big bunch of times. And then we add more parallelism inside of the core. And what's that? That's um, vector parallelism like SSE, right? So that means we have these, these two levels where the, the outer bits are the core to core parallelism and within the core we have vector parallelism. Two levels. Makes sense so far, right? Okay. Um, so, and once we've done that, we've gone from a machine that's very essentially constrained by latency, as in how long it takes to get stuff from memory and back, to something that's constrained by throughput. Like how much can we, in and out, can we get in and out? And that's a much, much happier place to be. And the machine that you get, um, even back in 2008, looks much different. You can see the, the thing is just paved with floating point units. And that's a much, much happier thing because it can go, it can process much, much more data. And then you think, well, the guy must be joking because I've noticed none of that. Right? Um, but I promise you that you will. And when I said, well, you, have, you, have you noticed your notebooks getting faster? Well, no. In fact, so this thing that's sitting right there um, has this chip in it. I bought it in 20, uh, 2011 or something. And if I went out today and bought, you know, the, sa the same machine from that same line of laptops, uh, it would have that chip in it. And it turns out, per thread performance, as in sequential performance, would have gotten worse from here to here. Not much of a step up, is it? <laughs> so if you look at that, though, um, these chips have two components on it, right? There's, there's this GPU bit here, the, or rather the graphics bit, that renders what you see right now, and is just kind of generally good at um, doing things like rendering your screen, which is very parallel, um, and is not very good at sequential tasks. And that is the bit that's been growing significantly over time. And it's those conventional processor cores that have shrunk in comparison. Just because they're much harder to get good performance per watt out, right? So that, this is where um, much of the heavy lifting in terms of computation is going to go. So how do we program that? Well, um, obviously nobody really wants to worry about all the nitty gritty details of where things are and how many cores are there. Um, so really, who cares? I don't, but I still want to write code, so um, I talk to an abstraction of this. What's that abstraction? Well, the abstraction is we'll just pretend that we have infinitely many cores, that we're already at this nightmare limit. And we'll also pretend that we have infinitely many vector lanes within each core. And then we'll try to see if we can make a programming model out of that. And the insight that's really behind this is that um, taking a parallel program and executing it on a sequential machine or you know, making it more sequential, that's super easy. But taking um, a sequential program and trying to make it more concurrent, that's really hard, right? That's what everybody's been, been failing at for, for more or less decades. So if we just say, well, we'll, we'll start with just zillions of, of things that we promise to the machine, do this in any order and I don't care, um, and then try to map it onto the machine, maybe we're onto something then. So what happens is um, we describe our computation as an array of little bits of work. So each, each of these little um, boxes here is going to correspond to one function that's called and it can determine where it is in this funny grid. And the grid has structure according to the amount of concurrency that we've added, right? So we say, well, um, you know, one of these big boxes is going to correspond to what's go what, what goes onto one core and then one of those little, each of these little boxes is going to correspond to uh, what goes onto one vector lane, right? So if we have our um, our vector execution units over here, um, that's our hardware, and this here is sort of the software abstraction for it, then we'll introduce a little bit of, um, of terminology. This whole thing is gonna, be a, is gonna be called a grid, and the function that runs on there we'll call a kernel. And one of these big boxes is gonna be called a workgroup. 
and one of the little boxes is going to be called a work item. Okay, fair enough. Um, so then when we want to go and execute this, um, we'll just say, okay, uh, we'll take our first work group and assign it to our first core. We'll take our next couple work groups and assign them to cores, and we do that until we run out. And then we go, okay, within our first work group, or rather the first, uh, first few assigned work groups, we'll, um, we'll assign the first work items to the vector lanes until we run out. And then those crunch away, and then we do the next ones, and the next ones, and the next ones. So really, you can see how this, this, this grid structure just provides a pool of concurrency to draw from. Right? Um, and then, okay, once that's done, we'll, 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 con we'll continue and we'll assign the, the next work groups to the remaining course, or to, to the same course once those are done. So that's happy, right? And if you've, if you've ever programmed in CUDA or OpenCL, you've seen, you've seen this before. Um, right, and um, the abstraction is actually kind of nice in that it lets you um, define these grids to be one, two, and three dimensional, even though that's, you know, there's nothing in the hardware that's one, two, three dimensional, that's purely an abstraction thing. Right, okay, so how does Python come into this game? Well, um, PyOpenCL apparently makes that possible, so let me show you how that works. Can you still hear me? I guess so, right. Um, so what do we got here? Um, let's see. So this, this is a IPython notebook that you've probably seen a zillion times so far. Um, oops, hang on, I started this in the wrong spot. One second. I have to make it so that the output isn't there yet because if the output is there yet, that, uh, there already, that's gonna be boring for you to watch. <laughs> Um, let's see. Right, so I go ahead and um, I import all this, uh, all this stuff. Some of these modules are, are PyOpenCL and apparently um, there's something that takes care of arrays and then some, apparently there's, um, there's also something that takes care of math. We'll see all those in turn. Um, and now I want to do something super exciting. I will want to double the entries of a vector. Who's not excited about? <laughs> anyway, no. This is, so this is just so you can get a feel for what's going on. So I'll make myself um, a numpy array of 50,000 awesome random numbers, and I make sure that they're for now in single precision. And I'll create an OpenCL thing called a context. That's sort of a bag where you know all your data and code is going to live on. And um, as part of that, you have to decide um, what device. Um, that that context lives on. So if I do this here, I get a choice between um, an AMD OpenCL thing and an Intel OpenCL thing. Right now, both of those correspond to the CPU in my machine. Um, but if you were to program a GPU, then this would this would show up in this list. So um, I'll go ahead and pick pick the Intel thing. Um, and just just to show you uh, what this corresponds to system-wise, um, so the um, the OpenCL um, well, the, the base OpenCL implementation has gone ahead and looked in my, uh, on my system in this directory, etc OpenCL vendors, and it finds these two files here that tell it where to look for OpenCL implementation, so there can be multiple OpenCL things on your machine, and you know, each of these is just um, a, a plain text file that tells, uh, that tells OpenCL what shared library to load and where to, look for, where to look for the actual implementation. Well, good, okay, so we've got our, we've got our context, and then uh, my, my comments here tell me that I need, uh, need to create a command queue as well, and that already tells you, well, this queue thing is probably gonna take care of, of synchronization, right? As in, you know, some, the, the host is gonna submit commands, and then the queue is gonna take care of ordering. So, okay, I'll do, I'll do that. I'll make a command queue for my context, and then, um, remember, we had this array of 50,000 random numbers, so let me transfer that um, to the device, and I'll do that uh, by saying cl.array.2 uh, device. And I can't just say, well, here's a numpy array, transfer that over, because this transfer actually takes time. Right? So I have to also tell it, well, um, here's the queue that you, have to, that, that you should do this with, 
and um, that's done. And the underlying storage of this, with, uh, of my um, device array, is just a bag of bytes, which OpenCL calls a buffer. Um, I can get that by dot data. But beyond that, what I've, what I've done here is if you look, this says cl.array. That means PyOpenCL comes with its own thing that pretends to be a numpy array, right? So just like a numpy array, um, the, this, this device array now has a shape. That's the 50,000 that we had. It has, it has a D type, and it knows about its strides as well, right? Um, and you can do math on them, uh, on them as well. So that, that's not super surprising. I can multiply this by two, which is what we're going to do by hand. Um, but I can also you know, apply, uh, say, assign to this and square it and stuff. And um, well, the compiler was mildly unhappy with, uh, with the code that I threw at it, but eventually it, it did its job. Right? So these here are just the, um, the, the values of the computation. OK. But now let's actually run some, some C code on our compute device, which uh, I just said is just the CPU that, that's sitting right here in front of me. So uh, this is the program that I would like to run. And what's going on here? Well, it says, OK, uh, here's my triple quoted string that I feed to cl.program um, within my context. And um, it looks like C, because it is C. It's just got a little bit of extra gunk in it. So gunk in terms of you know, here I have to say kernel, because it's uh, function on the device and global because that points to some what's called global memory on, on the device. Um, but otherwise, it really looks like C, and then it, it finds where it sits in, in, in the grid, so what it, its global number is overall. Um, and we'll, we can call that you know, I just for its index. Um, and then just as, I, as I've done this, this has gotten compiled. Um, and I'll go ahead and run it. So. Um, in my program, I can just say program dot twice, um, and within uh, I'll I'll have to run this within a queue, um, and I'll have to specify what the what the overall shape of, of my grid is going to of my computational grid is gonna, going to be. And here I'm just going to use one work item for each entry of my of my array. So that means that's the same the same as um, the shape of of my numpy array. Next, I'd have to choose. Um, the size of my work group, but right now I don't really care so much. So I leave that up to the implementation and say, well, you know, you figure it out. That's what I mean by that, none. And um, lastly, I'll have to pass um, this buffer. So I'll go ahead and uh, pa pass the buffer uh, corresponding to my device array. And I do that. I get something back that's an OpenCL event that I could then use to synchronize more operations with that. But for now, I'm just going to ignore it. Um, and then I'll go ahead and see if the, if the result came out right. So we'll compute a vector norm of um, the result, which now sits in the A underscore dev, right? The, the place where we, we stored our result. And I can just get that back onto the host as a numpy array by saying dot get. As, as a method call, and I'll, um, I'll compare that uh, to twice my, my array A. So I'll print that, and yay, the, the, the error norm is zero, so that worked. All right, so um, what's the takeaway message here? Well, first of all, um, if you've ever used SciPy, then there, um, there's a thing in there called SciPy.weave, which lets you, you know, um, evaluate arbitrary expression, so, um, and it's, it's sort of, Nice, but it's always had this problem that you need to have all sorts of compilers and, uh, and um, implementation stuff installed to use it, so it's never been really popular. So OpenCL, uh, PyOpenCL and OpenCL are sort of that, but on steroids. You can use, you know, you can use PyOpenCL to carry out arbitrary uh, 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 computations on, you know, God knows what compute device. Could be a GPU, could be a CPU really, really fast, and you describe them in C, and you can just cleanly ship them off from, from Python. And the main thing that describes this computation is just going to be this, this idiotic string here, right? So that's great. Um, so let's think about that. Um, 
Well, if that was just a string, that didn't really need to be you know, completely set in stone by the time I actually wrote my program, right? So, um, but before I go into that, let me quickly just tell you about, about um, PyOpenCL and where to get it. So, um, this is, this is, the, uh, this is uh, uh, the part of my webpage, so yes, I like idiotic puns, thank you very much. <laughs> um, and um, so, there's both PyOpenCL and an older project called PyCuda. They've been downloaded um, a humbling number of times and there, there's binaries, binaries for Windows and um, zillions of Linux distributions. It, it pip install PyOpenCL works out of the box on, um, on OS X. So um, they're liberally licensed and sort of um, the thing that makes PyOpenCL powerful is not just the fact that it lets you talk to OpenCL, but it's also all the other stuff that's, that's in the box, right? So, um, you know, what you might not have noticed is this binary, so there's a compilation stage, right? There's a compiler that has to run to translate the C into something that the compute device understands and that takes time. So, you know, if you're, if you're writing Python programs, you're used to this, okay, I'll just hack my code, I'll run it, I hack my code, I run it, and the last thing you need is a compiler to get in the way and make you wait just for the binary to come back. So what PyOpenCL does is it caches the binary for you and when it, no, when it notices, hey, you're compiling the same thing that you compiled an hour ago, I'll just reuse the cached binary. Um, and it also does a lot of stuff that in C you'd have to do manually, like you know, cleaning up and checking for errors and stuff. So that means um, if you were to talk to, to OpenCL from C, you could expect to, to write um, anywhere between a factor of four and a factor of 10 more code just to talk to OpenCL. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty verbose API. It's not a bad API, it's just um, a little inconvenient to use by hand and PyOpenCL fixes that. Um, and the, in terms of dependencies, uh, PyOpenCL is really minimal. Um, it really just requires you to have NumPy and um, you know, uh, a, ver a version of Python that's by now actually really, really old. But we, we still do support 2.4. <laughs> Um, and it runs on all the platforms. There's a, the mailing list and, and stuff. And what's been really great for me to see is that um, a, a great number of people have started building stuff on it. There's a package that, that offers an, an, an FFT, for, for instance. There, um, there are packages that do uh, computational fluid dynamics and, and lots of stuff. Right. Okay, but so let's come back to this point, though. The code that we ran just there, just now, by virtue of OpenCL coming with just-in-time compilation really doesn't have to be constant at that point when we, when we write our Python program because there's no such thing as a proper compile time and we could just make use of that, right? It, in GPU scripting, the GPU code really does not need to be a, a compile time constant because there isn't a compile time. And to me, this is sort of funny because somehow, this whole idea of code thinking about other code and you know, code helping you write code seems to have got, got, been forgotten. It was really front and center in the 1960s when people were working with Lisp and sort of Lisp's crucial insight was code is data. It's really just the same thing and um, you know, computers can legitimately help you write your code. And it takes us HPC clowns, as in high performance clowns, to come back and say, well, that's actually perhaps a good idea. Let's, let's do more of that, right? Um, so all your job is then, in, the, in this type of setting, to come up um, with an idea and write some Python code that spits out some GPU code. But everything from, from this point on down is gonna be taken care of by the machine. And that's the bit that's left for you, and Python is really um, kind of good at writing code generators because generating code is really just the text processing task if you think about it at the most basic level, and that's something Python is really good at. So that's nice, and um, PyOpenCL is really, or the really to me, the, my, the main point of PyOpenCL is to make that possible. So why would you want to do that? Why, does it, why is it a good idea to generate code? Well, um, there, there's any number of reasons. 
So for example, if you're in the, in the business of trying to make something go fast, then you might have you know, lots of different alter alternative ways of writing a, a certain piece of code, and you could try and figure out which way goes the fastest. If you wanted to call that a fancy word, you would say, well, that's automated tuning. And you know, there's, there's, there's a big precedent of popular software packages like Atlas and FFTW doing exactly that. They try out a bunch of ways of running you know, matrix matrix multiplies or FFTs and use the one that goes the fastest on your machine. And here you can do that very easily. Right? You write a for loop over the different ways in Python. You generate all the code that does it. You run it. You time it. And you're in business. Very easy. Much easier than what these packages have to go through. Um, or, you know, if you're writing a library, as in if you're writing something that's supposed to be generic along some axis, then you're always in this, in this sort of funny gray area where you want to be flexible, but you also want to be fast. And every bit of flexibility that you add costs you performance. Except when you generate code where you don't have to give up performance for flexibility because you can just generate the code, right? So, um, you know, you could, if, if a user says, well, I could be wanting to run this on complex numbers, real numbers, single precision, double precision, and I can't really tell you up front, then you could just generate the, oops, um, you could just generate the, the code with the right, right data types um, when it's needed, and it turns out the array functionality in PyOpenCL does exactly that. So when you ask it to add an in, some 32-bit integer and a 32-bit float, it generates that code right when you need it. And it's easy. Um, or, you know, if you're writing a library and there's a zillion different things that, um, you know, the person using your code might be asking you to do, you can just substitute in what they, what they describe to you, spit out the code that does it, and you're good. Um, also, there, there are a bunch of high-performance reasons to use code generation, such as um, if you give a compiler more information, it can do more to make your code go fast, right? If the number of trips of a loop is constant, as in no, known to the compiler, it can just decide, well, is it worth it for me to unroll that loop or not? Or also, you know, um, at some point you might run out of register space, so any value that you don't need to explicitly keep in a register, as in store somewhere, that, that, might, be, um, that might be something that hel helps you save time as well. Right? So usually flexibility and performance are at odds with each other, and here this trade-off is with, with code generation, that trade-off is completely removed. One additional point is, well, there are other things like, say, C++ templates and, and things that promise, well, um, I can let you do generic programming of this type, you know, where I can, you, can, you can be flexible by substituting in God knows how many template parameters, um, but that's a real bear to debug because you don't know what the compiler did underneath. The end product of this is you'll see a C code that you can look at, and you can look at that and see if it does the right thing, if it would, would have been the thing that you would have written by hand, and so, you can debug this in two stages. You can first write your code generator, look at the intermediate code and see if you think it's right, and then run the intermediate code and um, see if it does the right thing. And if not, you go back to the intermediate code, you know, iterate on that, make sure that's right, and then you fix your code generator. So that means you, you gain something in terms of debugging as well. So to show you one specific example where, uh, where code generation is, might, might be a happy thing, um, I'll, I'll teach you a little bit about parallel programming. So obviously, uh, doubling, two ve doubling a vector is you know, um, not super exciting in terms of a parallel workload. And just about anything that's sort of of this nature where you say, hey, um, my output is the same size as my input is a little boring, right? You know, if, if, one output thing gives rise to, uh, one input thing gives rise to one output thing directly. Uh, ah, ooh, no. Um, so, how would you do anything that, that's vaguely even interesting computationally um, in parallel? One, and one thing that, that makes many, um, many operations of this nature possible um, is a scan. 
or rather, um, it's probably e it's, it's easier to think about with, it, with its other name, a prefix sum. Why is that? Well, what, what's a prefix sum? Um, if you have an array of numbers, then the prefix sum of that array is, well, the first entry of the array is this just the same as input and output. The second entry is the sum of the first two. The third entry is the sum of the first three. The fourth entry is the sum of the first four, and so on, right? Um, so overall, this is roughly what that looks like, right? We, we have, you know, so our, our input array, and we would like the sum of these two to end up in this entry, the sum of these three to end up in that entry, the th sum of these four to end up in that. And you look at that, and it looks sort of inherently sequential, right? Because if you were to write this as a for loop, then in, in the for loop, you would refer to your previous iteration of the for loop, and by that time, you're, you're more or less dead in the water in terms of parallelism. So how do we fix that? Well, it turns out, um, we can exploit a property of the operation that we're parallelizing, in which case this is just you know, adding stuff together. Um, and the properties that we're gonna need here is that um, addition is commutative, as in you, we can switch the order around, and associative, which is we can, we, we, we can regroup these operations. So th instead of doing this um, relatively simple um, type, type of, uh, uh, or if, instead of thinking about it in terms of this the type of simple dependency graph, we can shift things around a little and actually do a lot more work. Think about it, do more work, but be done much more quickly because all of a sudden, um, we've done things in parallel, right? Um, if you trace back um, from each of these output elements, which bits have gotten summed into each one. So right, this first guy just received the sum of these two. This, this next guy received the first and these two. Right, uh, right. if you think from here and from these. So um, obviously if you think about you know, what, who goes where, you quickly want to shoot yourself because that's a lot of indexing to write. It's, it's real annoying, but it's a very useful operation and it, it is what, what makes any sort of loop carry dependence possible in parallel. So just to, before, before I show you why, um, why this might, or how, how this works uh, using, using tools, let me quickly um, have you think about why that's a useful thing. So for example, if you wanted to sort an array of numbers, right? That amounts to saying, well, okay, um, I wanna calculate where everybody goes, right? Sorting is really just reordering a list and the complicated bit is figuring out where is everybody gonna go. And a scan can help you do that because you could say, well, okay, um, I'll just first decide based on um, you know, the first bit of every number, um, who's in the big part, who's in the, in, in the small part, and I'll compute a prefix sum that tells me, oh, okay, the first few guys are gonna go here and the, the, the second few guys are gonna go in the second part, right? And that's fundamentally an indexing computation that's based on, um, well, I, I need to count up and compute a new index for everybody. Or similarly, if you, want, if you wanted to filter a list, if you just wanted to say, well, everybody, uh, all the numbers that are bigger than 300 are gonna end up in the output, that's also a prefix sum because you need to compute um, a running sum of the number of guys that are bigger than 300, right? So in that sense, a, a scan is a, is a very, very fundamental operation. It's anything that in, in regular programming you'd, you'd write with a loop carry dependent. So right, um, I was gonna show you how that works in, in PyOpenCL. Um, So okay, this, this here by now is old hat. I import the business, I create um, a context and a command queue, and um, instead of generating my, my array of random numbers um, using NumPy, I'll use PyOpenCL's built-in random number generator. Um, then I'll create, a, I'll, I'll compute my prefix sum, and in this case I wanna compute the prefix sum of the squares of all, element, uh, of all elements in x, in this, this vector x that I've just created, and I'll call that result one. So using numpy, that's super simple, that's the cumulative sum 
over x, but x is a device array, so I'll have to get the data from the device first, and then I square it. All right. Now we do the same thing using PyOpenCL, and apparently there is a widget um, in PyOpenCL called generic scan kernel, and I can make myself one of those. And I've provided a little cheat sheet for myself here to, to get all the arguments straight, so I'll have to provide um, a context. I have to provide a data type. In this case, um, that's double precision. Um, I'll have to pro provide an input, or I'll have to provide arguments, sorry. So that's gonna be, so if I look at the call site here, um, that's gonna be my result, and that's gonna be my input, just in C notation. Um, then my input expression, as in the thing that reads the input and tells me what I need to, need to scan over is just um, x index i times x index i. Remember, we're, we're summing squares. Um, then my scan expression is just a sum. So PyOpenCL provides two symbolic arguments, a and b, and I just have to tell it what to do with those. So that's a plus b. Um, I have to tell it what the neutral element is. So the neutral element, and as in the element that does nothing in a sum, is zero. And I have to, uh, I have to tell it what to do with the output. So in this case, I just want it to write the output um, to result. All right, do that. And um, behind the scenes, it's gone ahead and taken all these snippets and pasted them into a C template. So I could go look at the C code if I want it. Um, but here I'll just go ahead and run it, and I get back again a, a Pi op an OpenCL event, and I'll check if the result came out right, and it didn't. Oops. Oh, right, because those are um, are doubles. Sorry about that. Ah. Oh, yeah. So it's really a live demo. That's how you can tell. Okay. See how that went? Yay, it worked. So um, just to, that, yes, so floating point addition is actually not truly associative and not truly, well, almost commutative. So that's why there's a little bit of a difference, but it's small compared to the overall, um, the overall difference, right? That's, um, it got about 10-ish you know, digits in the result. So that's happy, right? So that's re it's relatively easy to take that and express um, what would be a nightmare of, of a computation to express in parallel, and PyOpenCL makes that easy, and the thing that makes it easy is code generation. Well, all right, let's see how far we can take this. Um, so some other things, oops, I suppose I, I should use this. Some other things that, um, that the scan would let you do is, you've, so, so you've seen you can do processing on output, you can also pro do processing at this um, uh, on input, and you can also do processing on the output. You can have uh, segmented scans. You can work on compound types. So you can do relatively general things with a scan. Uh, so for example, um, within, open, uh, within PyOpenCL, there's already um, pre-built pre functionality that lets you filter lists or partition lists or sort lists or build lists of lists, all of which are um, all of a sudden not so easy if you want, the, want to do them meaningfully in parallel. Right, but we can take this even further. So uh, this is the, this is the last. Uh, well, to me, that's the the hot new thing. It's if if you've seen talks by me, it's been the hot new thing for quite a while. Um, I've been working on this. This is this is supposed to be something that makes um, expressing array computations um, really quite easy. So let me show you how that works. So what's, uh, this is called loopy, and what's it supposed to do? Well, okay, by now this, this top bit here is old hat, I import pyopencl, I create myself a context, and I'll create myself two vectors using um, pyopencl's built-in uh, random number generator, and then um, I do something with, with loopy, where, which I've imported here as, as lp. And loopy, apparent, apparent, uh, loopy has a thing called a kernel which corresponds directly to an OpenCL kernel, as you've seen. And what does it do? Well, um, it turns out I don't, I don't need this, this bit up front here. I have to tell it two things. I have to tell it 
what is the range of, of values where I would like um, work to be done. So here, um, what, I want to be, what I want to be done is um, an output, C, to be um, what's called the outer product of two vectors, as in Cij is just going to be Ai times Bj. Easy enough. Um, so uh, I would like that to happen for i and j all between, uh, between 0 and n. Fair enough. So that's really simple. Um, and so I, I asked Lupi to make that kernel for me. Um, I set an option so that it'll show me the OpenCL code that it generates. And I go ahead and run that, and I feed it um, these two pi OpenCL arrays that I've, just, that I've created um, just earlier. And, you know, it'll, it'll give me the output matrix and this, this event thing. All right, so here we go. Um, it's generated code for me. And this is sort of, you know, um, that's nice. It's done what it, I've told it to do, except um, what's wrong with that? <laughs> so I've said a lot about these, these funny computational grids, right? And it's, it's really, um, you want to run in parallel. And this is a for loop, that's not parallel. So that's dumb. So let's go, let's go and fix that. Um, and we'll fix that by um, telling Loopy to do something with our loops. And in this case, we'll say, well, what we would like to do is I would like my, I, my loop over i to, sp to be split into groups of 16, and I'll have an I, uh, a loop i outer, and I'll have a loop i inner. And I'll do the same to j. And I'll implement my, um, my outer loop as, you know, the, um, as a group dimension, and I'll implement my inner group as um, the index within, within one group. And the OpenCL code that does that looks like this. So obviously I've, I've chunked into, into groups of 16, so that means there's a corner case at the end. I might, my, you know, my, my, my array size might not be divisible by 16, so I have to check for that. And, and Lupi has done that for me. And then I might think, well, actually, I would like um, the, uh, the A and the B to be prefetched, as in read from memory before I even get started. So I do that with um, using add prefetch on A. But so far that hasn't really done anything, it's just read A and B into a variable right before its use. So really what I wanted to do is um, to read A and B into a variable that got reused a big bunch of times. Namely, um, for all iterations of the inner loop. So I want to read all those um, into memory ahead of time. And this is where you start thinking, well, wow, um, this is starting to look really unappealing. I'm not sure if I wanted to write that on my own, right? But what, what's happened here, what, uh, what Loopy has done for me is it has put in all the, um, all the, all the, the checking on the boundaries. It has read B into um, a local variable, it has read A into a local variable, it has carried out some synchronization, so this, this happened all in parallel, and then um, the stuff gets used to, to write out C. Okay, fine, um, but if you look at that, that's still a big bunch of if statements. So th those take time, so let's try and get rid of some of those um, by checking um, if we're even in a corner case, and if not, just have one um, have one big bit um, of code that, that takes care of everything. So if I do that, um, then I have my very clean looking, right? Just fetch, fetch, barrier, and store um, case. And then I have all my, all my idiotic corner cases. Now recall what, we're, what we were trying to do. This was just an outer product of two vectors. So if you're trying to do something that's even more complicated or that's you know, legitimately more complicated than that, that could be a big nightmare. And Loopy's job is to, to remove that nightmare. That's its purpose in life. So um, it, it'll do that for you. Um, it'll do a bunch of other things too. So um, as you write your code, it will check um, if you have all your you know, I's and J's within bounds, if it can do that as in if, you, if the bounds are not data dependent. Um, it can also just generate a sequential version of your code so you can, you can check if the parallel thing is right in the sense of um, producing the same result. Um, it can also provide code for you to try and benchmark different versions uh, against each other. It, when it can, it tells you, well, well, actually, I don't think that this is the right way to tune this. Um, you should maybe do, do something else instead. 
It can also provide automated testing against the sequential version. Um, and something that, that I think is really kind of neat is um, so one thing that compilers generically st struggle with is changing the, the, the layout of the data that they operate on, right? And this can, this can be very meaningful for performance, um, how your data is laid out in memory. But a compiler can't change that because it must prove that whatever changes it makes are not visible to the outside. And, you know, data layout is um, inherently exposed to the outside. Whereas in Loopy, you can just run a transformation that says, well, make that actually, um, you st store that differently, add some padding, or do, do something complicated. And by telling Loopy to do that, you assume responsibility for that, and it's fine. Right? So this is um, sort of the, the next thing that makes array-style uh, high-performance computations hopefully much, much easier. And it's, as you've seen, it's, it's built on top of PyOpenCL. It'll be um, MIT licensed, and um, I'll be presenting that at an uh, array computations workshop soon. So that's, by the, uh, that's in June. That's when I'll have to release it. Um, I've been sitting on, the, on that for way too long. Right? And it's meant to be infrastructure. So, you know, if you want to, do, to build automatic, automatic tuning or, you know, some higher level system, then Loopy is meant to enable that. All right. Okay. So, to me, this is really sort of a super interesting time to be in high performance computing, but it's really also one of these times that historians in the future will look back at and say, well, it was interesting because there was all this stuff and nobody, nobody really knew, knew what they were doing. And this is, this, this is one proposed version of the future. Um, right, and to me, um, combining GPUs and then scripting really works well together because you can use scripting languages like Python to help write all this horrifically complicated code. Um, and Loopy is, is, one, is my best hope for trying to help with that. All right, thank you very much. So, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to take questions, but... Uh, yeah, we, 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 uh, we can ask some question. Is anyone want to ask? Okay. Okay, there. Uh, uh, you see your mic. Hey, Andreas. Here. Back here. Um, what Thank about you. doing all of this in civilized Python syntax throughout with decorators, what do you think the language is missing, if anything, so that we could write, we could write a kind of in a higher level, scientist-friendly syntax? Because I think, as as amazing as Loopy is right now, it's still for many domain scientists, it's still a little bit too low level, and there are still too many exposed knobs that that really were the were the the OpenCL kind of pieces percolate out to the surface. Um, do you think it's feasible to do it in a, in a much higher level syntax? So personally, um, maybe at some point, but I don't think we're there yet. And I'm generally not a fan of things that try to slather Python syntax over um, some relatively complicated lower level thing that's going on. So um, many of the attempts that, that, uh, that exist really, to my mind, have, have the issue that you... In, and so the claim is, well, you just have to know Python, right? And that's, and that's gonna be enough. But the truth is really that you have to all of a sudden know three things. You have to know Python, you have to know the language that it compiles to, and you have to know what the translator does. Because as soon as you break it, um, you'll see error messages that will expose something from any of these levels, right? So, you know, the, the common, or rather one joke that I've recently read, uh, a domain-specific language is where a program is written in one language and the error, message or, or error messages are given to you in another, <laughs> right? And all the, all the attempts that I've seen so far fall into this trap. So until the time when you can really cleanly make all the OpenCL nonsense go away, I think it's much more sensible to just expose the details. If you, if you can manage to hide them reliably, and right now, I think that that's too, amb that's too ambitious a thing. Um, then you could, you could uh, proceed to a point of, of saying, well, okay, it's hidden and you don't have to worry about it. But I don't think we're there, we're there yet. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, is there any question? Yeah, 
Yeah, but following up that kind of DSL thing, do you think how long it will be actually hiding into the CPU instruction set? Say, say that one more time. So I mean, I mean, all this uh, low-level detail um, GPU or many core kind of control syntax uh, could then all become part of the instruction set someday. Well, in some so what, to my mind, one of the beautiful things that OpenCL does is it removes you from the, what exactly the open uh, whatever the CPU instruction set is which that, that's powerful because all of a sudden um, we're not tied to x86 anymore, right? C CPU des or rather processor designers are free to innovate on, on the instruction set and then put all this stuff in there. And really you talk, op you t you talk C or maybe LLVM to the front end and then the implementation is free to take that to whatever um, instruction set, set um, they've, they've chosen for this iteration of the chip. I think that's, that's very much the right thing and that's a good comment, but I would rather not go back to the bad old days where the instruction set, set of the machines shows through. It's, it, to, to my mind, being able to talk to a machine in C, which is perhaps already a bit high level, or LLVM, is, is very much a good thing. That's, that's the right way to me to expose a machine and not uh, very much at the instruction set level. So you're talking about something like a LLVM IR as a representation layer rather than the OpenCL language, right? Right. So um, if uh, a recent thing that's, that's happened in, in OpenCL is in addition to what I've shown you, which is op OpenCL's brand of C, you know, C with, the, with a bunch of extra keywords, um, is uh, you can take more or less an unmodified version of LLV, LLVM's um, intermediate representation, which they've called OpenCL Spear for, I'm not exactly sure what it stands for actually, um, but it's, it's, very much open, uh, it's very much LLVM, and you can ship this off to uh, OpenCL directly and it will take it and execute it on the device. And to my mind, since you're trying to talk to this really broad range of devices, that's sort of the lowest level that, you, that you'll be able to go sensibly. There's also a way in, in OpenCL to talk directly in binaries, but then you become very device dependent. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, okay, I think uh, time is up. So let's uh, give Andrews a big hand. Thanks for this nice talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>